So what is good? What is goodness? How can we say this person is good or this person is bad? Well, there are multiple instances in which we use the word goodness. For example, we say, oh my goodness, when we are surprised. Or we say, for goodness sake. We use this word very lightly. However, goodness is in fact one of the virtues that exemplifies the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We are in a sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit as we seek to live radical lives in our families, among friends, and co-workers. We want to live in the way of Jesus. The key passage for this sermon series is found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. You probably already know it. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. I was listening to the song with my, with my younger son the other day. Goodness, you know, that song for little kids. Today we are going to talk about Goodness. And the suffix ness means state, condition, or quality. It is used with an adjective to describe something about the object. In this case, the fruit, the produce, the outgrowth of the spirit. Goodness, by its own definition, is the quality or state or being good. Let's notice that the emphasis is not on doing, but on being. The fruit of the Spirit will only come from the inside out. It is a byproduct of living lives committed to the Lord. Anyone who has the Spirit of God in them will have these virtues portrayed in their lives. Each week, we are choosing a real fruit to help us be reminded of the way that God has called us to live. This week, we look at the apple, you know. We all know the saying... An apple a day keeps the doctor away. That's because apples are low in sodium, fat, and cholesterol. They don't offer protein, but apples are a very good source of vitamin C, especially during coronavirus. We need to eat a lot of apples. Okay? They're rich on vitamin C and fiber. You know, one medium apple, such as this one, has about 100 calories so they are filling and they might help us with your you know help us with our heart with our digestive system and also if you want to lose some extra pounds you might want to get some apples a day not only one you know they seem to be good for your heart to lower the risk of diabetes wow they offer digestive health they might might fan of cancer. Uh, they contain compounds that help with asthma. But there is more. There is more. The apple is filled with goodness. When you bite an apple, I, I ate one this morning just to be, you know, good with the sample. It's delicious. It is just filling. And you say, oh my goodness, this is a good apple. You know, the apple reminds us that goodness is grace to the core. It is by grace. In fact, it has been always been by grace. Think about it. What makes something good? For example, a good burger, you know, a good car, a good person. In a world that relative goodness, you know, it's portrayed. Do you ever feel like being good is kind of a moving target? You know, how can we have good lives? How can we be filled with the goodness of God? So let's go to our passage today, and it is found in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. I want us to look at what goodness is not, the origin of goodness, and the outgrowth of goodness. Let's look in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. The Apostle Paul starts by describing what goodness is not in order to explain what it really is, the opposite of goodness. There are about a hundred different places to go in the scriptures for this word goodness. But Paul gives us a good synopsis in this chapter. Paul is writing to Titus, 
who is one of his disciples. Titus has traveled with Paul and served with him on his missionary journeys. Titus is like a church planter. You know, he's like a church planter. In fact, Dr. Uh, Kelly has helping us to, to do some church planting here with the BGCT. You want to know about that. God is doing amazing things. But Titus is like a church planter. He's pastoring a church in Crete. Now, most of us don't remember what Crete is. And much less what was the social situation around 75 AD. Many of you know, maybe not. Well, Crete is the largest Greek island right in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. It is a beautiful place that if you want to go, I go with you later. But it was a dreadful, horrible, challenging place to do ministry. Any takers? Not many, right? Crete was described as a place where it was almost impossible to find personal conduct more disloyal or public policy more unjust than in Crete. So it is in this context that the Apostle Paul says, verse 1, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. These two verses will make the world of a difference in this particular cultural moment, especially during this election season. We have an opportunity to stand out as light in the world. We noted last week that kindness is our superpower in the power of the Holy Spirit. We noted that living out these things is a counter-cultural act of faith. The type of love that really does win. God's kindness really leads people to repentance. And God's goodness really changes lives. Do you believe that? I believe that today. So Titus has a big job ahead of him. And that's why Paul is instructed him to remind the church in Crete of what they used to be that it wasn't goodness. So he starts to outline four things that aren't goodness. Verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. First, he says, they were mistaken. They were foolish. The word foolish in the scripture more often means that you lack any kind of a spiritual sense. You don't know what is actually good. This is just not making mistakes because we all make mistakes. It's being mistaken at its core. Being mistaken is all about focusing on one's life. It is characterized to live in a life of being selfish. In other words, me, myself, and I. This is very important to grasp today because being good is fulfilling what you were designed to be and to do. Think about it. The hamburger is good because it was designed to taste good. I'm making you hungry, okay? Just hold on. A football team is good because they win games, some of them. Cars are good if they take you from point A to point B, and you feel comfortable in them. But if the hamburger tastes horrible, it's not fulfilling its purpose. If your car won't run, it's not fulfilling its purpose. If your team is not winning, you just change or just suffer. It's not because of the understanding that you are not good. If you believe in it, then you are not good. You are foolish. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. You are mistaken about what is good. Let me ask you this. Have you ever asked yourself the questions, what am I good for? What am I here for? You know, what am I supposed to do? I, we want nothing less than to have meaning. And sometimes, sometimes life has a way of just clouding that so much that we are ignorant of our own purpose. And we ask, what good am I? 
Maybe the world will be better without me. This is mistaken. This is mistaken. But then also the apostle says we are misbehaving. We are foolish. A mistaken identity always leads to misbehavior. Let me repeat it again. I like this phrase. You can hashtag, you know, you can post it. A mistaken identity always leads to misbehavior. If you don't know who you are or whose you are, you will not know what to do. Think about this. Most of the world would say that you measure whether someone is a good person by the good deeds they do. So if someone does more good than bad, they are good. But it's not always the case. If someone gives $20 every day to a person in need for 10 years, but then go and murders someone, we consider them to be a bad person. Despite the fact that they have a thousand good deeds against the really bad one, they are bad. A scripture also talks a lot about good deeds. In fact, it is mentioned twice in this passage today. Even more, of course, a scripture promotes good deeds, but a scripture doesn't take good deeds as an indication of someone's goodness. Let me tell, tell you what I mean. A good apple, a good apple, is one that is firm and tastes good. I would eat it, but I don't know who touched it before. A bad apple is brown, is soft, smelly, and it actually emits gases. So one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch of good apples. Good deeds, my friends, to God cannot be goodness because the Bible teaches us that God is the only one that is good. He is the standard. Anything less is bad. And we are all morally, ethically less than God. The biblical word for God's goodness is righteousness. He is righteous. He is good to the core. He has been always good and he is good. I love this saying. I know it's cliche-ish. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. The young ruler came to Jesus in Mark chapter 10. Remember this episode? He came to him and he said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life. He replied to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. He went on to say that he had kept all the commandments from his youth. Jesus looked at him and lovingly told him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all you have and give it to the poor. He went away because he didn't want to share his possessions. Listen, it is not by what we do. It is about what we are willing to let go. Hashtag Rolando Aguirre. And the scripture supports this as it is written. No one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Romans 3, 10 to 12. We aren't just rebellious and foolish, but the apostle also says that we are misled. Misled means led astray. He says we are misled, yes, by our own sin, which makes us susceptible to misinformation. We have said it before that Satan's primary activity begins with a disinformation campaign. This is what he does, and he's good at it. And we have a lot of misinformation in our days, and many people is being misled. You know, Satan deceived Adam and Eve to eat from the tree that God told them not to. His misinformation campaign, his deception preceded their disobedience. You are the object of a grand conspiracy against God, against his goodness, and even against what is good for you. And the way that the enemy does this is by convincing you that God doesn't do good things for you, that he is not working on your behalf, that his ways are not the good ways, that God is really against you, that he's really against the humanity, against the entire universe he created. We are being told that the things in which are really good are really bad. 
These are lies that are being pumped at you 24-7. Let me give you an example of some of them. You are a failure. <laughs> you are completely alone. You are not loved, not accepted, not validated. No one understands you. If anyone just knew who you really were, they wouldn't love you. Everyone, including the God that made you, has disappointed, disappointment in you. Do you believe those lies sometimes? Sometimes we do. Stop. These are lies. And because we believe these lies, we start to believe other lies. We start chasing other things that makes us feel good, like sex, materialism, promotions, ambitions, selfish desires. We start assuming that our worth comes from what we produce, rather than what God produces. So we are also misguided. Passions and pleasures are wonderful things, aren't they? I am passionate about so many things in life, and, and you know, these two are connected. When passion is satisfied, we experience pleasure. When we desire pleasures, we develop passion. And hear me here when I say this. There is nothing wrong with having a passion. There is nothing wrong with producing pleasure from something that is not contrary to God's commands. The problem is when we become enslaved to it, when it is a compulsion, when we worship it, when we have to have it. So the Apostle Paul says, verse 3, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. He describes the word malice, which is wishing evil, wishing misfortune on others so you can have your own pleasure. Envy, resenting those who have what you desire. Hating others, responding with any antagonism toward you with equal or greater hate. Passions and pleasures are great, but when they rule your life, look out, watch out. And all these together, mistaken, misbehavior, misled, and misguided, make a pretty convincing case that goodness, it is nothing that we can really produce. I hate to be, to be the bearer of bad news, but you cannot, we cannot, on our own, produce good fruit. Because if you think you are a good person, then you won't actually ever worry about becoming a good person. I want us to allow the Holy Spirit, just for a moment, just to consider today that we are not good people. I know it sounds negative, but if the measurement is God, then we are not. But the Bible doesn't leave us there hopeless. There is the origin of goodness. Verses 4 to 7. Do you ever wonder why people don't eat the apple core? I mean, why they don't eat the seeds? We eat different kinds of seeds, sunflower seeds, various grains, flat seeds. Have you eaten some of those? I was on a plant-based diet for about eight months. I ate a lot of seeds. <laughs> why not apple seeds? Here's the reason. Every single apple seed contains poison in it. <laughs> Maybe you heard of it. It's called cyanide. Yeah, the cyanide that kills people. But you need to... Uh, eat about 200 of these. So if you have a plan against someone, it's not going to work. <laughs> it's 200, okay? 200. So how is this? This is crazy. Ha, one of the most delicious, healthy fruits in the world, the picture of goodness. Oh, my goodness. The subject of the proverb, one apple a day keeps the daughter away, can kill you. The apple seed is not good. Good fruit springs from something that we can not produce. He can only produce death. So here is the lesson. How can we get this? And perhaps the better question is, what does it have to do with me, Rolando Aguirre? Friends, the seed is you and me. We are mistaken, misbehaving, misled, misguided seeds. Well, goodness has to come from the outside source. We have to be grafted into a living root system because we are not capable of making goodness from ourselves. Let's look at what happens in verse 4. 
It says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appear. Let's look for a minute. God's goodness and his kindness appear. These are the same words for kindness that we talked about last week. His philanthropy, his Christopos, his kindness. He saw our need and not only saw our need, but he acted. He responded. It appears his goodness breaks into our helpless situation. God sees our mistaken, misbehaving, misled, misguided situation and he adds. So what appears? What appears? Jesus Christ. Christ appears. He comes. He intervenes. And then he is our savior. He is our redeemer. We have hope and now we have a new life. I'm getting excited here. Woo! You know, verse 5. He saved us not because of good works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of the regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Remember, goodness in our society is measured by good works done by us. So if you do good, you're good. But here, God is telling us that is actually not the case. Good works done by us actually don't make us good. It's something else. It's a process that is done entirely by God by his grace, by his love, by his mercy on us. He washes away our misdeeds and gives us a new life. And we find this fancy theological term called regeneration, which means he gives us a new life through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, he makes us a new creation and we hear the old has passed and the new has come. Yes, it has passed and the new has come. Verse 7. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection covers, destroys, and reverses all those misses from above. All the ways in which we are mistaken, the ways in which we have lost our purpose, and the ways in which we are, we are forgotten. He gives us purpose. He makes us whole. You look back to despair and agony, but now we look up to a hopeful future. All the ways that we have done wrong, misbehaved, and violated, all the ways that God had wanted us to live, we are forgiven. We are forgiven. All your past is forgiven and forgotten, and these are good news, my friends. These are good news for all of you who are watching us online. All the ways that we have been misled, deceived to believe that what is good is bad and what is bad is good. The truth comes in a person. The truth comes in a gift. The truth comes in Christ, in Jesus Christ. He comes to set us free. The Lord is now in charge of all these things and he has given us authority over them. If you put your faith in Jesus, if you trust in him, if you believe to him, if you believe in him to make you good and to have the goodness not based on anything you do, but instead based on what he does, guess what? Guess what? You are good. You are good. His grace has made you good to the core. You have been grafted into a new vine, into a new tree, a tree that produces a delicious good apple fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, uh -huh. kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control, my friends. And Paul in Romans 11 describes salvation in this way, being grafted into the people of God. I love this imagery in the scripture, this picture in the scripture. We are being grafted into the body of Christ. 
And the people of God produces good fruit. And here's what is this old thing works. God is good. God is good. God is that measurement of goodness. He is the ultimate goodness. He's the thing by which all the other things are measured as good. And we cannot be good apart from him. The Bible says, apart from him, we can do nothing. I grew up looking at my mom struggle with cancer until she passed away seven years. She made sure that her children always heard, God is good. My God is good. There might be things in your life that you think God is not good and God is not working on your behalf, but God is good. He remains in his throne and he is good. The outgrowth of goodness, we see it here in verses 1 and 2, verses 8 and 9. The saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. It is God. It's being connected to him and transformed by him that makes us good. But it is good works that shows the world around us, believers and non-believers, that we have Christ. We are no longer slaves. This is good news. And goodness is demonstrated by avoiding certain things and by doing certain things. This is very descriptive in the Apostle Paul. He always says, there's certain things you have to put on and there's some things that you have to put off. And he's giving us an example in verse 9. He says, but avoid Foolishness, foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments about the law because they are unprofitable and useless. Avoid controversy, stirring things up, avoiding legalism. So what does it look like to have the outgrowth of the Spirit? He plainly states it in verse 1 and 2. He says... Like being a good citizen, speaking good of others, and being good to others. Simple. Being a good citizen, speaking good about other people, and being good to others. We have all that we need in Christ. Being guided by his spirit filled up and overflowing with the fruit of his presence and of his spirit and the goodness of God. Being expressed in our life in every encounter that we have with people every day. You, we can shape the world by where you place your attention, by where you place your money, by where you place your compassion, your love, your energy. Many of us are so focused on the meta-political narrative that we have forgotten that the kingdom of God advances in the small staff. One life at a time. One story at a time. One miracle at a time. And that's how we rebuild the goodness of God. Our memory verse for this week is found in Romans 12, 21. And it says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And the goodness of Christ is in our hearts through our Holy Spirit who resides and lives in us. We tell our story from the resurrection forward. Many of us are telling our story from a traumatic event, from a difficult situation, from the pandemic, from the political arena and situation now. But God is teaching us today that we tell our story from the perspective of the cross. 
You can do this. We can do this. Because Jesus has overcome evil on your behalf by living the perfect life through the suffering and shame on the cross, by being raised again, conquering evil once and for all. He gives us his Holy Spirit to overcome evil in our lives and to live in the goodness that he has implanted within us, his Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are so good. We come before your presence and we adore you for who you are. Lord, there might be persons and people watching us today that don't know about you. And perhaps today I'm going to invite you to, to repeat this simple yet profound prayer to come before the Lord. If you haven't known about Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. You come to Jesus. You say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Cleanse me from all of our mistakes, my misguided life, my mistaken life. And today, I receive the gift of Jesus. I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. I ask you to come into my heart. In Christ's name I pray, amen. But many of us are here and we walk with the Lord. And perhaps the only act of goodness that we could have is to come before him today, just as we are. Lord, we come before you just as we are. We are not good, but you are good. Lord, thank you for your unending, unconditional, never-breaking, giving-up type of love. Thank you for loving us so much, for sending your son Jesus to die on our place so that through him we could be good. Help us to honor you with every act, with every word that we do and we say. Help us to be good citizens. Help us to help other people. But most of all, help us to do and fulfill your will. Your will, Lord. Nothing else and nothing less but your will in our lives. That's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.